much earlier in the conversation, we put a pin in this idea of deep versus shallow ways of mm. achieving these kinds of enormous uh, multiples. So let's dig into that. Um, this is something that you mentioned to me a week ago. We had a pre-call to kind of yeah. talk about what kinds of topics we could be covering. And when you found out how technical our audience was here at Super Data Science, you thought that a great topic to cover, and this isn't something that I've had on air before, mm -hmm. is this idea that we've alluded to earlier that in many cases, shallow approaches to machine learning. So I guess maybe you can give us like a definition there. I guess I'm assuming in my head this means anything that isn't a deep neural network. So it could be a shallow neural network or I guess any other machine learning approach. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm using the word shallow just, as you say, to contrast with deep learning. And um, I think what would count as shallow is everything with exactly one nonlinearity layer, and that's kind of it. And maybe a matrix before, so a linear layer before and linear layer after. Um, kernel methods that we have talked about is one such example. It's basically... so. In many cases, at least, you can also make them deep, but uh, let's not dig into that. <laughs> um, so one linear layer before, non-linearity, one linear layer after, and that's kind of it. Um, why do I think this is interesting? Because, um, number one, in extremely many cases, you can get exactly the same performance out of these um, architectures. Um, and number two, you can often compute them in a much more efficient way. Um, and even if you choose to, you can go sequential um, in, in a much more efficient way than you could in uh, deep networks. So I think uh, th there's been a few papers out in recent years that have looked at classical methods uh, like, for example, um, random forests um, and made the connection between random forests and uh, deep networks. There's actually in kernel methods, there's quite a few papers that show, okay, if you take multi-layer perceptrons or several other architectures, ResNets, um, uh, ConfNets, and take a certain limit, for example, like the classical limit is you make the layer width go towards infinity, what you get out is a kernel method, really, with one particular kernel. Um, and on the other hand, people that have tried to look at practically, can you get the same performance out of these types of shallow methods that you get out of neural networks, deep learning methods, when you just scale the number of parameters and the number of data that you throw at it. And there's many very interesting results, for example, by Mikhail Belkin at uh, UC San Diego, who did exactly that and then showed, yeah, basically same number of parameters, same amount of data, kernel method uh, performs at least as well or sometimes better than um, neural network architectures. Um, why this is interesting? Because we can, number one, we can understand these systems also theoretically. I think in general, why I find this interesting is just um, from this contrarian viewpoint of you, you understand more about your standard method, about deep learning by looking at these other methods and um, how you make them perform well. And some, um, something that uh, I sometimes uh, discussed with my leads in, in my previous company was uh, they they were like, yeah, but why don't you try this and that method as well? And I'm like, yeah, but to make this method perform well, I have to invest uh, thinking time. Um, if you invest the same thinking time in what I currently have and think about, okay, what, uh, what might help this algorithm, um, you oftentimes get better results um, just because you have more insight into the problem that you put in into this. Of course, one nice thing about this deep learning revolution, we talked about it before, the tinkering is really nice and easy oftentimes. And 
we are converging slowly but surely towards architectures that you can just use in a plug and play fashion. Transformers libraries by hugging face, you just take this and hit everything with it and you're kind of done. This also exists in the shallow world. Some Kaglers uh, say XGBoost is all you need um, <laughs> because it performs just phenomenally mm -hmm. oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so XGBoost, for people who aren't aware of it, I think I have do done an episode dedicated to this, um, but it's a it's like a, the random force that you described earlier, um, where at each stage you're specifically correcting for the error made at the previous yeah. stage in the tree. Yeah. Um, and yeah, super, super powerful. It does end up winning a lot of Kaggle competitions. Absolutely. That's for sure. Yeah. Nice. Well, that was a fantastic uh, foray into shallow um, approaches. Um, and yeah, I, I, do, I, I do agree with a lot of the sentiment that you're describing. It was particularly interesting there to hear you say how when you focus further on some particular approach that you started with. Yeah. So um, it could be uh, a kernel method, it could be random forest, it could be deep learning. By sticking with that and tinkering further, yeah, yeah you probably are more likely, it's probably a better use of your time than just randomly trying out switching to the completely other approach where the hyperparameter is gonna be completely different and maybe you don't have as much expertise yourself in figuring out. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And the other thing is, uh, people do it in deep learning also all the time, right? They think about, okay, how is my data structured? How do I adapt my neural network to to be able to capture that? Yep. And so, in your time, in your master's in linguistics, or your PhD focused on natural language processing, um, were you mostly using these kinds of shallow approaches? I was actually building Bayesian networks. So uh, back at the time, I did a lot of Bayesian work. This was very own work at the time, uh, Bayesian non-parametrics. Uh, I think it kind of developed. It was own work in parallel to the neural network stuff. Um, so yeah, that's what I used in my PhD. I was working on modeling meaning of natural language using this um, probabilistic language, basically, which is Bayesian networks. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that was mostly what I did. Cool, yeah, and some people are doing kind of Bayesian deep learning stuff. You don't come yes. across that very often. It's usually shallow, yes. not true. more than one nonlinearity. And so that was probably true in your PhD research. Uh, yeah, um, this is true. This was true in my PhD research, yes. I think the reason why people don't tend to use um, Bayesian neural networks as much is probably because the really interesting part is getting probability distributions. This is the interesting part about the Bayesian approach and that you can get even without uh, computing integrals as you do in Bayesian uh, inference. 